All right. Uh, I will introduce our director here at the New Haven Museum, Margaret Ann, um, who will start the program off whenever she's ready. Thanks, Khalil. Welcome everyone to New Haven Museum. I'm Margaret Ann Tarkashewski, Executive Director, and we are delighted to have you with us tonight for this special presentation in celebration of Women's History Month. Published in 2019, Yale Needs Women, How the First Group of Girls Rewrote the Rules of an Ivy League Giant is an unflinching account of Yale's first female undergrads. It was written by tonight's speaker, Ann Gardner Perkins, who has invited three dynamic Yale women to join her in conversation. Everyone who registered for tonight's talk was entered in a drawing for a signed copy of the book. And I'm happy to announce the winner is Virginia Tyson and we'll be in touch with you following the talk. I'd like to thank our education director, Leo Koktap and educator Kim Carew, who'll be moderating um, the questions uh, for coordinating tonight's program and all of you who helped us publicize it. We originally had scheduled this talk for last March and then our whole world changed. But a year later over Zoom, we're able to reach a much wider audience. And so but for that, we're grateful. Tonight's speaker, Ann Gardner Perkins is an award-winning historian and higher education expert. She grew up in Baltimore and received her BA from Yale University where she won the Porter Prize in history and was elected the first woman editor-in-chief of the Yale Daily News. After Yale, she won a Rhodes Scholarship and went on to spend her career in education. Anne holds a doctorate in higher education from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a master's in public administration from Harvard University. Yale Needs Women, her first book, won the 2020 Connecticut Book Award for nonfiction and has been named by Book Browse as a best book for book groups 2021. Please welcome Ann Gardner Perkins. Thank you so much, Margaret Ann, and my warm greetings to all of you who are with us this evening. Over the next hour, we're going to explore together the moment in our nation's history when some of America's most prestigious colleges, when Yale and its peers, finally admitted their first women students. It was 1969, a time not unlike our own when Americans were raising their voice in protest over longstanding discrimination against women and people of color. The world was churning. The Black Power movement was changing how Americans saw race. The Vietnam War was raging, as was the protest against it. The Stonewall riots had just laid bare the discrimination faced, against, faced by gay men and women. And into that moment stepped the first women undergraduates at Yale. What happened next? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. And we are so lucky to have with us tonight one of the women who lived this history, Connie Royster, and two women student leaders at Yale today, Mackenzie Hawkins and Zoe Hobson. It's a rare chance for dialogue between past and present. And I am so grateful to the New Haven Museum and Historical Society for sponsoring it. So here's our game plan. I'll begin with an overview of the context into which those first women students arrive. Then Zoe and Mackenzie and Connie will join me for sort of a live interview. And last, it's over to all of you for your questions. So sound okay? Let's begin. And to do so, I'm gonna ask you to think about what Yale was like in those very first years before women arrived. To do so, I like to think of it as a village of men. Yale had been, Yale College had been all male for 268 years before those first women students arrived. It was the oldest all men's club in the nation. This is the 1916 cheerleading squad. If you look at the caption underneath, you may recognize one of the names, but Yale was a place of and for men. The women did exist, but they were in the shadows as wives, as dining hall workers, as secretaries. There was a small handful at the Yale Graduate School in 1968. And one thing I like to emphasize is that Yale may have been an extreme, the most male of the America's college campuses, but it wasn't an aberration. 
The list of US campuses that continues to deny admission to women's students at that time reads like an academic who's who from Amherst College at the start of the list to Yale at its end. I've highlighted in blue the five Connecticut colleges that denied access to women. Um, but what happened was Yale in November 1968 makes its announcement front page of the New York Times that it's admitting women. Princeton follows a few months later. And finally, that co-education taboo in American most elite schools is lifted and a wave of co-education changes higher education forever. But what I found when I researched this book was that had Yale President Kingman Brewster had his way, Yale would never have admitted women at all. Now here's a confession. When I first began this research, I had this sort of fuzzy notion that somehow the women's movement must have been the reason Yale went co-ed. Maybe Kingman Brewster had a copy of Kate Millett's Sexual Politics on his bedside table, and he'd read it at night and elbow his wife, Mary Louise, and say, this stuff is amazing. But the chronology was all wrong for that. Sexual politics, Tony K. Bumbaras, The Black Woman, Robin Morgan, Sisterhood is Powerful, shown here. None of them come out until 1970, two years after Yale admits women. The women's movement was really just getting started in 1968. It's so new that the word sexism is still put in quotation marks in a 1969, the fall of 1969 article in Time Magazine discrimination against women is still perfectly legal in this country. So why did Yale admit first its women in 1969? One reason, activism by Yale's male students. This is a replica of a poster that was papered all over the Yale campus in September 1968 by a guy named Derek Shearer. This was Derek's younger uh, sister, Brooke, that's pictured here. And the question he's asking of Mr. Brewster, why can't I, on his sister's behalf, why can't I come to Yale, was one of many efforts by Yale's male students to have Yale go co-ed, but they weren't enough. They had been pushing since 1966 with no measurable results. And the reason was that Yale President Kingman Brewster worried that women students would threaten Yale's mission. Yale's mission was to produce national leaders, a thousand leaders each year to be exact. And because men are leaders and women are not, or so Yale reasoned, Yale should give as few slots to women as possible. But Brewster started getting some troubling memos from his admissions office, pointing out that those top male students who Yale wanted were turning Yale down in increasing numbers and choosing to go instead to campuses that were co-ed or like Harvard, had a sister school on the same campus. If Yale wanted to continue to attract the nation's need leaders, Yale needed women. Now I can't show you Pringman Brewster without showing you the woman he hired to lead the transition to co-education at Yale, Elga Wasserman. Wasserman was never given any of the tools she needed to do her job. She had a bogus title shown here, nothing that was recognizable in the Yale hierarchy almost no budget, little staff. She lacked the respect from the Yale president, but she managed to create power in other ways and was critical in those early years of co-education and moving Yale closer to equity. Now that tension between Wasserman and Brewster runs throughout the early years of this history, but to me at least the heart of this story are those young women pioneers who broke the gender barrier at Yale, those first women students. Who were they? The New York Times called them superwomen. Most of them are just teenagers. They come from all over the country. 62 had graduated from Connecticut high schools. Most of them were uh, white, but 40 of those first women students were African-American, 13 were Asian-American, three were Latina. Some were wealthy with last names you might recognize, Beinecke, Pillsbury, Firestone Ford, but others had to patch together their tuition through financial aid and summer work. They were smart and they were tough. That's how Yale picked them. Girls who were athletes, girls who had lived abroad, girls with four brothers. I interviewed Sam Chauncey, who along with Elder Wasserman chose that first group of women and I'll never forget what Sam told me. There was no point in taking a timid woman and putting her in this environment. 
because it could crush you. Now, I've always loved this photograph, this young woman striding across Yale's campus taken in the first week of co-education. But I like this photograph as well, because for me, as, as, uh, it also sort of resonates that isolation that was felt by many of those first women students. Yale might have called itself co-ed, but it put in place a gender quota limiting the number of women to just 13% of the student body that first year. As one of the freshmen wrote, I could walk for, walk for blocks at night without seeing another woman's face. Now the flip side of that isolation, that loneliness for these first women, as it is for many tokens, was the sense of always being under the spotlight. This young woman has just registered to be a student at Yale. She walks out of the building and bang, there's a reporter and the TV camera asking her, what is it like to be a woman at Yale? This, as I said, was a national story. And the reporters often came, at least to my mind, from what I've read and seen with a story already written here, for example, is a photograph from a spread that was in Look magazine. And what do we see? A scantily clad young woman wearing only a towel, talking on the telephone, curlers in her hair. Hardly an image of strength or power. Yale's first women endured many challenges, that isolation and exposure among them. They were spread out across Yale's 12 residential colleges so that each group of men would have its own small cluster of women. They had few older women who could serve as mentors. Of Yale's 407 tenured faculty that first year, just three were women. And just because the phrase sexual harassment had not yet even been coined, didn't mean it wasn't going on. But they were smart and they were tough. That's how Yale picked them. Now, when I sat down to write this book, I didn't wanna write it from above. I wanted readers really to feel what it was like to be one of those first women. So I decided to tell this history through focusing on the stories of five women in particular. You're gonna meet one of them tonight, Connie Royster. I'm gonna introduce you briefly to the other four. This is Elizabeth Spawn, who went by the name Betty when she was at Yale. She was Connie's roommate that first year and they have remained lifelong friends. Betty came to Yale from a conservative Republican religious Midwestern family who distrusted the morals of the East Coast establishment and didn't understand why the University of Illinois where Betty's mom had gone to college wasn't good enough for her. In her very first months at Yale, Betty endures two challenges which changed both her entire politics and in fact her life after, during and after Yale. This is Shirley Daniels. Now, you know, the Yale Needs Women focuses on that abrupt transition to co-education at Yale in 1969, but you can't write about gender without writing about race. And Shirley, like Connie, is one of just eight black women in the sophomore class that first year of co-education. She comes to Yale from Roxbury, Boston's historic black neighborhood. And she was bused from there to a white high school where the white parents were none too happy to see her. But Shirley was smart and she was tough. And when she learns that Yale is going to offer one of the first Afro-American studies majors in the nation, she sends in an application and writes as she told me with her whole heart why she wanted to go to Yale. Kit McClure starts as a first year student in 1969. And you see her here playing the sax. And what I need to tell you, if you don't know this, is that was pretty much unheard of for a woman in 1969. A sax was a boy's instrument, as was trombone, which Kit also taught herself to pay, play after her parents forbid it. Girls don't play trombone. Kit came to Yale with an even bigger dream, however, starting an all women's rock band. And indeed, that's why she graduates a little late uh, after 1973, she had to take time off to cut their first album. The last of the five women who form the backbone of Beyond Needs Women is Laurie Mifflin. She's the uh, young woman on the left there. Laurie grew up outside of Philadelphia. She was an athlete. She played field hockey every uh, year since she was 11 years old. She brings her hockey stick and a bag of practice balls to Yale. She goes to the athletic office to sign up for the team and the guy tells her there isn't a field hockey team. 
and there wasn't a basketball team for women or a swimming team or a tennis team, Yale did not offer a single team sport for women that first year of co-education, even though it had 17 varsity sports for men, as well as a slew of JV and club and freshman teams. And so Laurie set out to change that. I wanna show you one last photo before I have Zoe and Mackenzie and Connie join me. And that's this one. These are also two of the first women students at Yale. That's Judy Burkhan, who starts as a junior and Barbara Dinehart, who started as a first year woman student and they're dancing. And I love this photo because while all those challenges I laid out for you were part of the first years of co-education, so too were moments of laughter and joy. Indeed, I can't imagine how those women would have made it through those first years of co-education without them. And with that, I am delighted to introduce you to Connie Royster. Here's her photo from the Yale banner, the Yale yearbook, the year she graduated. Connie grew up in New Haven and in 1969 enters Yale as a sophomore. There she flourished as actress, dancer, and community volunteer. And after initially hoping to start a career in publishing, she went on to become a lawyer. Connie served as an assistant US attorney in New York and an associate at Paul Weiss. She was a founding and managing partner of a major minority and woman-owned firm in New York. And in the 1990s, Connie moved into fundraising and ultimately became the director of development at Yale Divinity School. Mackenzie Hawkins studies ethics, politics, and economics at Yale, where she serves as editor-in-chief of the student newspaper, the Yale Daily News. As aspiring journalist, she has covered local government in New Haven and the San Francisco Bay Area and reported on California politics and policy for the Sacramento Bee and Politico. When she's not writing or editing, Mackenzie enjoys clothing design, solo backpacking, and developing her amateur cooking skills. And Zoe Hobson is a junior at Yale studying political science while fulfilling her pre-med requirements. With an interest in healthcare policy and maternal health disparities, she spends her time advocating for diversity in medicine, public health, politics, and education. Zoe serves as the current president of Yale's Black Women's Coalition and is one of the directors of Black Students for Disarmament at Yale. She plans to go to medical school after graduation. So welcome all. And Zoe, I thought I would start with you. And I know you've read Yale Needs Women. And I would love to hear, you know, one or two of the things in it that surprised you that you hadn't known about before you read the book. Yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, I love the book. It was a really great read. And just reading about Yale and like the place that I you know see every day and historical context is really interesting about and learning about these, hearing these places that I frequent often and not knowing the history behind them was really interesting. So thank you for writing it. Um, I was really shocked by, I guess, Brewster's reluctance to admit Yale, um, admit women into Yale. And the fact, of course, Yale is going to be Yale. Anyone who knows Yale is knows that we're competitive and that we have our, um, our rivalries with the other Ivies. So like the competition between Harvard and Princeton, Brewster's definite, um, our decision to admit women into Yale was largely based on women being compared to amenities. I think you have this line saying that um, the top men of the top male students during this time period were leaving going to Harvard and Princeton for the availability of women, which was like an amenity, which is similar to like, oh, there's kitchens available or like there's a gym available. So just women and their brilliance and talent being reduced to something as minuscule as an amenity. Um, and that being one of the ruling decisions to you know, create this change that really, really like shaped what Yale is today. I know so many brilliant people at Yale and so many brilliant women at Yale. Um, so yeah, this is like a huge, huge decision that maybe wasn't made for like the decisions that, the reasons that we thought it was, but I'm glad it was made in the long run. Yeah, something I do want to say, and I, I didn't, I, I should have mentioned it in the opening talk. I mean, Brewster, um, there is no doubt that Brewster stands in the way of equity for women students, women faculty, women administrators. But as um, then student Kurt Schmoke said, he was a complex man. And so he 
while he's sort of blind to the equity for women, he is also working very hard to advance equity for public high school students who at Yale uh, to end anti-Semitism, fighting against racism. So he he's he's not a perfect villain. He has many admirable traits as well as the as this con uh, my own concern about the blindness towards women. What about you, Mackenzie? Um, anything that struck you about this history? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Yeah, just first of all, I want to say thanks for, for having me and thanks for writing. This is such important history to chronicle. Um, so I appreciate your, your work in doing so. I think I had a similar reaction to Zoe in that I was surprised and also disappointed by the motivations for admitting women to Yale. Um, but I think that the fact that it didn't come from an equity motivation and perspective is reflected in how some of the same issues discussed in the book persist at Yale today. So I think it made a lot of sense to me, although it was still deeply disappointing. I think one thing that particularly stood out to me, this is a relatively small detail, but this 30 million figure saying that's how much we need to get women into Yale, suddenly as soon as the admissions um, portion came into the picture, that 30 million concerns sort of disappeared. And I think that, you know, I have observed as a journalist and as a student, Yale using money as a reason to or not to do something, usually not to do something, when we all know that Yale has a massive endowment as you kind of outlined in the book here. So it was just interesting to see that kind of logical reasoning persisting at that time and to today. So that was kind of one granular detail that I picked up on. Um, but I would say overall, I, I had the same sort of initial reaction as Zoe. Um, that women were something Yale could offer to men rather than offering a Yale education to women. Yeah. You know, that money point you bring up is such a good one. Um, one of the things I discovered in the um, archives was this report that Dartmouth had done looking at Harvard, I mean, at Yale and Princeton and trying to decide, well, should Dartmouth admit women too? And one of the reasons it decides coeducation is a real winner is that Yale made so much money off of coeducation. It helps it balance the budget because what it's able to do, it would not have been able to say to the men, guess what guys, what we're gonna do is increase the number of students and have you, ha you know, have three guys in rooms meant for two without the excuse of being able to say, and that's the only way we're gonna get women here. And so they, use overcrowding as a way that ends up helping their budget, not just not just not hurting it, but helping it. So Connie, you were there this whole time. Um, anything that you didn't know when you were a student or, or, or is this all, you know, was this all just sort of repeating for you what you knew already? Oh, not by a long shot. Um, I learned so much um, from Anne's research and her book, even though I lived through it, uh, which just goes to show you can learn uh, more and more every day. But, you know, first, let me say that um, I was happy and thrived at Yale um, in my hometown. And um, telling uh, Anne my story through many, many interviews um, brought back a lot of memories for me of um, my family's long connection um, to Yale. And um, my, my grandfather was a chef at Skull and Bones and I had cousins who were managing the fraternities and the, the secret societies for decades. So um, my, my time at Yale was, uh, you know, for the most part, really, really good. And I, I would say also that one of the things about being a woman at Yale is that you don't um, you, you don't follow directions. So <laughs> I can't limit myself to one thing as uh, having learned from Anne's book, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, with respect to the women, what I learned from Anne's book was that I was quite surprised by how many women were subjected to sexual harassment. Um, I really had no idea how bad it was uh, until um, reading Anne's book and then in subsequent conversations um, since the book has come out. Uh, no idea. And so um, that has really kind of stood out to me. Um, and with respect to the administration, um, what, I, what I learned and what was surprising to me was that Elga Wasserman, who we held up as you know, our mentor and our, the, the most senior woman at Yale that we knew, 
um, was really disempowered. Um, and that kind of pricked a bubble for, uh, for me that I, that is um, ver been very hard to, um, to hold on to uh, over this last, you know, whatever it's been now, two years since Anne's dissertation and the book. Um, and, that, and, and that King and Brewster didn't really want us. Oh, well, we were there and we made our mark and we continue to make our mark. So those two parts of the administration, um, the Elga not having the power and struggling to keep and get the power and Kingman not really wanting us um, really uh, were surprising to me. What about you, Anne? What did you, what, did, what surprised you? Um, you know, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna address your um, sexual harassment thing before mm. we move on, because I'd also love to hear what, what Mackenzie and Zoe um, think about that. And, and I, why don't I tell you just a little bit more about how I approach that. So I, there was nothing documented in any of the secondary literature about sexual harassment of women um, at, at, in co-ed schools at this time. Uh, but I thought maybe. Uh, and so what I did was I um, have a friend who's a nurse, a nurse who um, works in a crisis center and I went to her for some advice. And cause I thought, should I not even ask the question because I don't want to traumatize anyone. And what she said was, if you don't ask that question, you're saying that any woman's experience who was sexually harassed or sexually assaulted is not important. So no matter how uncomfortable it is, you have to make yourself ask that question. And, and so I would write it and, and every once in a while I would chicken out because it's an uncomfortable question to ask. Um, but I did ask it and stories kept coming out and I've heard many more since. Uh, generally stories about um, a Yale faculty member. If you would sleep with me, you get, get an honors uh, in this class. And if you don't, uh, you'll get a C. Um, and I think why women who were there at the time don't know about it, because A, there was such a stigma, you know, it was assumed to be the woman's fault. And B, there was nothing to be gained from sharing it. There was no process at Yale. There was no hope of having anything done. So it was not a rational act to talk about it. Um, and just sort of looking at my own experience, um, I got to Yale in 77 and, it, and it's something I really regret. It's something I could have done something about by writing stories, more stories in the Yale Daily News. But I was really ignorant when um, Alexander versus Yale was, um, uh, that, that landmark case when, in which determines that uh, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination comes out. One of the people named was the guy who was my field hockey coach my first year at Yale. I had no idea. I had no idea. So even then, um, uh, it, it wasn't widely talked about. Um, Mackenzie, Zoe, I, I, any thoughts on how that is now at Yale? The, the stats don't look great. Um, yeah, the stats aren't great and the climate isn't great either. Um, I think, you know, every time I talk with a non-male friend about sexual assault, I hear about another story. Um, and it's something I've dealt with in, in my reporting. Um, some of the reporting that I'm proudest of and was most difficult for me was about sexual assault and harassment on campus or by people who are on campus or were on campus. Um, and I think, you know, that was the most striking parallel also in the book between Yale's climate 50 years ago and Yale's climate today. And I think despite a lot of institutional supports, you know, we have a good Title IX office. There are places that people can go for mental health and counseling. I don't think it's good enough, but it's there. The issue persists. Um, it's a cultural issue. It's not a matter of putting band-aids with different offices and resources. It's incredibly difficult to hold someone accountable still. Um, and I don't know what the perfect fix is. I just know that almost every female friend I have at this university has had some measure of experience with um, a comment or something physical that happened to them. And it, it breaks my heart, honestly, um, as a woman at Yale, as a student at Yale. Um, and it's sad to see how little progress has been made on the issue over the past five decades. Yeah, my sentiments mirror like yours exactly, Mackenzie. I was, it was disheartening to see that 
a lot of the same things that I was reading in the book are also things that I like encounter with talking to my friends every day and like other women on campus every day. And Mackenzie, like as you mentioned, like there are support systems that are in place, the Yale Mental Health, there's the campus consult um, or campus consent educators and things like that. But even on a smaller scale, like women of color and like black women, especially like this is also an issue that affects like us on campus and there are like even fewer resources that black women feel comfortable going to. So it is something that I think that there, like there is conversation around on the student level and like on the grassroots level and there is like activism like work being done. But I think this needs to be a larger conversation about like within the culture and within the community about like what it means to have like a safe, safe sex and safe consensual sex on campus in a world that, you know, isn't privy to sexual assault and sexual harassment towards women or towards anyone. Yeah. One thing I do want to say is in writing this history, I often felt so proud of Yale women and Yale women as trailblazers because, you know, the very first time that at least documented so far that the phrase sexual harassment is used is in a discrimination complaint by Yale women in May 1971. So that phrase is coined at Yale um, by Yale women. And you kind of keep looking through the history of uh, women in higher education. It's Yale women who file a groundbreaking case, Alexander versus Yale. It's Yale women who have what ESPN called the uh, Boston Tea Party of Title IX when the Yale women's crew team strips and writes Title IX all over their bodies to protest the terrible treatment they're receiving. So Yale women really, Yale women students really have been out there at the cutting edge. And I think that's something to be proud of. Um, so uh, why don't we go to the next question, which is sort of has to do about change towards greater social justice and kind of, you know, you go to Yale at a time when Americans are standing up against longstanding injustice. Any insights on what you think stood in the way of change at Yale? Um, and, and you can put change in any category you want in general, change for women, change for African Americans, change for la, la, Latinas, la, whatever, or what move change forward. You can look at that either way. Just curious your thoughts. Sure. Well, you're quite right. Um, we arrived in 1969, um, the women, and of course, uh, that was the middle of uh, civil rights movement. Um, Vietnam War, uh, the women's movement, um, you know, you name it. Um, the, you know, cities were uh, burning, um, you know, here on campus, there were, um, there was a lot of student activism um, when we got here and, um, and Yale went co-ed, um, not quite on the same scale as some of the other social uh, movements that were going on, but in, the context of higher ed, it was a major shift. And so a lot of things were swirling all around us. And um, I think what, um, what moved change uh, here at Yale was for all his um, you know, issues uh, was Kingman Brewster as our president. And his speaking that truth um, to power about black people not being able to get a fair trial in the United States. I think it set, set a moral tone for the campus at the time and, um, and, and probably has carried through ever since um, because um, it, it, it was and is true to this day. And those, and what he said um, made a huge difference in the campus um, in, in May 1970, um, being a campus where a civics lesson was going on in plain sight, um, where, you know, thousands of people came to New Haven um, and the National Guard and the trial, uh, the Panther trial went on and unlike other campuses in the United States, um, there was no bloodshed. And so I think that that made a big difference. So I, I have to credit Kingman Brewster for the change, um, the forward movement 
And, and then Inky Clark, who was the Dean of Admissions at the time, who opened the college to, you know, not only people, first men of men of of color and from private schools, a uh, non-private school, sorry, public schools, but then, you know, women. Uh, so there were those were things that made a huge difference in being able to have Yale move forward. I think though that um, the things that stood in the way were, there were not enough women. Um, you know, we, we were minuscule, as you mentioned, there were, what was it, eight, eight black women in my class, the class of 72, 40 black women, I think is the number you, you, you came up with, um, in all of the women who showed up in 1969. And then, you know, whatever it was, 575 women all told, is a, not a good uh, percentage. What is it? One in eight, one in seven, as a, compared to the to the men, and it took a, quite a long time to get those numbers up in terms of equity uh, on on the campus. It's not just the students, though; it's the faculty, um, and uh, you know the administration. Um, it's the, it's not just the women faculty, it's the black faculty, you know, it's, it, it was not there then. And, uh, I think it's, you know, it, it has taken and is still taking quite a long time to get those, those numbers up. Yeah. So that's my, my take. Um, Zoe, what about Yale today? You know, what's, what's standing in the way of change? What's moving change forward? Tanya, I'm going to say that I honestly was going to say a lot of the same things you were going to say. <laughs> um, I think that we are in a time, like another, another period of like time in history where the twines of like maybe complicity are that held this nation together are un like unraveling. And a lot of these conversations are happening about the injustices that have been persisting from like the 1969 and before until literally the foundations of our nation. Um, so I think that like in, in times of this turmoil, I think change happens. So this is one, a really exciting time to be on campus and also like, kind of a really disheartening time to be on campus because as truths about like the complicity of like the Yale and Yale administration, the Yale the industry and the corporation um, are unearthed, there is also this like energy from the students that's like really passionate about issues like climate change and divestment from fossil fuels and um, police brutality and racism and, and feminism and things like that. So there are like movements that the students are really passionate about. Um, I like also will say that I think the diversity and the inclusion of like the Yale, the Yale student population and like the Yale faculty has so, is something that really needs to be like improved. And I think it has for sure um, over the last couple of years, but I still to this day can count the number of like black professors I've had and things like that. And I think that the more diverse your population is at like on campus, the more perspectives you hear and the more like conversations there that are able to have to elicit change. So I think that like that might be one of the biggest things standing in the way. And I think also just the financial ties that Yale has makes makes Yale admin make decisions that maybe aren't the most ethical. <laughs> we'll, we'll say it like that. Um, well, um, I think that like a lot of times at Yale, the administration, Yale, the entity, I don't know how, we students often like separate like Yale, the people and Yale, like the Yale, the corporation, um, just really sometimes values the money and the prestige and the, the name of Yale over like the soul and spirit of Yale. And I think that once we get to the grassroots and are really like like stoking the fire under the students and really like looking at individual relationships with students and between students, hopefully like we can like make a big enough and strong enough movement and impact to like elicit change among the administration and among like the nation and communities, wider communities. Thank you. Your, your energy and passion gives me hope for change. So Mackenzie, you've got an interesting view of change in the student body at Yale from your role as reporter and editor. Um, what do you think is advancing change at Yale? What do you think is standing in the way? Yeah, I think um, similar to what Zoe was saying um, and what Connie was saying, 
one of the things that struck me the most about Yale when I first arrived is just how active the students were. I felt like between things going on on campus and also before I was editor, I covered um, city hall and local politics in New Haven. So I was out in the city a lot. There was always something going on, some action being taken, some protests being staged, some demonstration. And I feel like, you know, every significant change that's happened at Yale or that is underway at Yale during my time here has come from the bottom up. Um, and I think that, you know, the same kind of pressures and incentives um, and monetary ties that probably plagued Yale's advancement 50 years ago are plaguing Yale's advancement today. Um, but I think that students have, in the past, students have had success um, in advocating for a new cultural center to be established in pushing for changes to Title IX policies. Um, students right now are working on reforms to the UWC process on accessing menstrual hygiene products. And I think you know, the more that students are able to see the realization of their own efforts and the actualization of those, I think that, you know, that's the locus of change. And as a journalist, I kind of try to step back and look at, you know, where's power centered at Yale and where's change coming from at Yale. And I think that although power is centered at the top, change really comes from the bottom. Um, and I look forward to say that the Yale administration becomes more quickly responsive to that. But at the end of the day, if students are saying, this is something that we want, this is something that we need, Yale ultimately is nothing without its students, um, despite the many other things that Yale is. And I think that Yale will be a better place for responding uh, more agilely to student concerns. You know, something I always like to tell students is I, I do think students are more powerful than they even realize. And so um, I couldn't agree with your comment more about that. Um, so uh, I promised Kim we would turn the uh, session over to her to make sure that the audience has time to ask at least some of their questions. So um, Kim, over to you to, to share some of the audience questions you've been seeing in the chat. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, ladies. It was such a tremendous and interesting and informative uh, conversation. Uh, we do have some questions, and uh, the first one is, why did it take so long for the true account of first women students to come to light? And how were these stories suppressed so effectively? Um, I guess I'll take a crack at that, although I, you know, you all should feel free to pitch in. I don't know if they were suppressed um, as much as, um, uh, so what I found was when I, the secondary books and, and some by some very good historians that had been written about uh, those years at Yale, co-education at Yale, uh, were written by men and wrote about co-education solely from the perspective of men. So I, I guess I might be a little softer on that by saying it was just a total blindness of, of thinking that you could actually tell the story of co-education without um, talking to women about it. And that when you looked at Yale's archives and saw what the existing oral histories were, and they were all of men, except for three at that era from women, one Elga Wasserman, one the president's wife, um, uh, Griswold's wife, and, and one other woman. It, again, it was just this assumption that it's men who are at the center of the history. So um, I, I, I think it was more a matter of no one asked rather than that people were worried it would come out. It's, it's not really a history to be proud of. I mean, we talk about Yale leading the elite schools in this time, but really the leaders in co-education are the historically black colleges and universities who are leaders in co-education and the public universities who are leaders in co-education. Yale likes to think of itself as a leader, but it has really lagged on this issue of equity for women and has a lot to learn from other institutions. We have another question. Let me just add, Kim. Oh, sure. Um, that I think this is the first time that a comprehensive history of the time has really been um, done. There have been some um, documentaries. There have been some short, short films, um, some interviewing. Um, there have been, as Anne said, some some other books done about um, co-education, but um, not co-education from the perspective of the women who were there and with our voices. Um, 
the documentaries and the films that I, I mentioned were about, were interviews with women, with the women students, but not all put together in a book form with the historian's lens, which Anne is. So I think that partly um, answers that question as well. All right, we have another question. What advice can you share in how we can hold Yale accountable for increasing the amount of women, the amount of women of color in the senior ranks? What's the way you're McKenzie, you want to ask that one, answer that one? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. Um, I, if the answer was super easy, I, we would have like definitely done it by now. But I think that like, I think McKinsey and um, Connie and I have been like really emphasizing is that like a lot of the work comes from the students. Um, I think like it always starts with conversation about like the lack and sometimes like maybe the history of Yale women on campus admin is so far removed from the situation that they don't even realize it doesn't it doesn't, hasn't even crossed their mind that there is this like gaping hole this inconsistency between the genders of like genders and in races races and ethnicities of senior ranks and I think that the more we engage with admin and really advocate and support like the black professors and admin that we do have the more um I guess higher leadership will realize that like how valuable it is to have people of different like backgrounds and races and genders be in positions of power because when we're in we when we have sit at the table things get done. Um, so I think just yeah just having those conversations with like among students among admin is really one way to hold each other accountable um, and also just really really being there to support and hopefully like keep our black uh, black professors and really like fight for their tenure and things like that. Any thoughts okay. on that, McKenzie? Um, I, I will say something, Connie, I don't know if this struck you. I, I was um, invited back to Yale's campus for the wonderful celebration they had in the fall of 2019 of the 50th anniversary of, of women undergraduates that Connie and a number of women really took the leadership in organizing. And I attended just in the audience, one of the first panels and after it, one of the women raised her hand and said, you know, we had practically no um, women professors when we were at Yale, what's the percentage of women on Yale's faculty now? And she asked this of President Peter Salovey. And Peter Salovey said, I don't know. And I was like, what? You don't even know the percentage of women on your faculty? How can it be a priority if you don't even know the answer to that question? And so Salovey looks at the dean and who's sitting in the front row and says, Marvin, what is the percentage of women on the faculty? And Marvin says, I don't know, but I'll look it up. And he starts, you know, typing away on his laptop to look it up. And he gives us a bogus figure. He doesn't, you know, it, it's padded because it includes tenure track in addition to tenure. And the question was specifically tenured. But I do think that the administration needs to set this as a goal. Um, and I, I don't know if the Yale administration ever has. I mean, who's what's the, 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 the best track to be president of Yale is the track that Kingman Brewster took, is the track that Peter Salovey took, it's being provost. And who has Peter Salovey appointed as provost? First a white man, and then when that guy stepped down, another white man. And so there's not attention to this at the top um, as it should be. We actually have someone who just said, isn't it past time that a woman becomes president of Yale? We yeah. have a question for Connie and Anne. Did you consider going to an all-American women's school? Do you have close friends who attended, say, a seven sisters school? In hindsight, how do you compare your collegiate experience to theirs? So um, I transferred from an all women's school. So I came to Yale as a sophomore. And so all sophomores and juniors transferred in to Yale in 1969. Um, and I don't, I'm, Anne may have the numbers, but many of us transferred from all women's schools. Personally, maybe, I, just to step back, maybe the vast majority 
transferred in from all women's schools. I, I know um, uh, I transferred in from Wheaton College in, in Massachusetts. Um, I was very happy at Wheaton. <laughs> um, I would have been happy to stay there if I hadn't gotten into Yale. Um, so, and I'm, I am a fan of all women's schools. Um, so I, I have no um, beef with that. Um, I wish my daughter had gone to an all, all women's school and she chose not to. But I also say that uh, young people end up where, where they are probably best meant to be. So uh, many of my um, close friends now who came to Yale with me did transfer in from all women's schools. So um, as, I, uh, as, as Margaret Ann mentioned, I grew up in Baltimore. I went to an all women's high school, uh, at the Bryn Mawr High School, which was a wonderful school, but I was really done with um, going to a women's school by the time I graduated. And I also, you know, I was sort of this, you know, little feminist and I would wear this button around that said 58 cents because that was what women earned compared to men. And it ticked me off that Harvard and Yale had not always accepted women. And um, so I, this shows my incredible arrogance as an 18 year old, I applied to two colleges. I applied to Harvard and Yale. I got into both. Um, my best friend from high school also got into Yale and that's where she was going to go. So that's where I went. Martin actually said that we did have an acting president, Hannah Gray. Oh, baby. <laughs> That's like feeding me that question. So Hannah Gray <laughs> was provost. Brewster gets, um, and, and this happens uh, right before I get to Yale. Brewster's appointed as the ambassador to England, leaves his job at Yale. Hannah Gray moves in as acting president and, and kudos to Brewster on that. He had appointed Hannah Gray as his provost and uh, the Yale Corporation does this. So she's the, the vastly most qualified person for the job of president at Yale. The Yale Corporation does this big search and lets Hannah Gray know just six months into her acting presidency that she's not gonna get the job. And instead they give it to a guy who had barely even chaired a faculty committee at Yale, a guy whose major administrative role had been the, um, what was then called the master of styles. Uh, Bart Giamatti turns out to be a wonderful president. He was a wonderful man. I, uh, he was the beat I covered as a, a reporter at Yale, but to compare his qualifications to Hannah Gray's and to say that Hannah Gray um, achieved the status of president when it was made quite clear to her that she was not qualified for it um, is really comparing apples and oranges. Not that I haven't- Someone, ju that someone just noted that, <laughs> that other provosts have become uh, female presidents at other schools like MIT, Cambridge, but not at Yale. Yeah, Hannah Gray goes on, when she gets dinged for the job at Yale, she becomes the president of the University of Chicago. So Yale's losses, University of Chicago's win. Nice. I'm watching the time. We're getting close to uh, the hour. And I'm going to ask that Margaret Ann, our executive director, comes back in to wrap this up. Margaret Ann. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we do we want to wrap up? Did we want to? I know Mackenzie has a a stop at seven, but if, were there other questions? Or I know prior to this we had some other discussion. Um, so I'm happy to go a few more minutes if you like. There's quite a few people that have shared their experiences while when they were at Yale, if you'd like me to uh, read those. Not necessarily questions, just their experiences. Would you like me to read them, some of them? I'll, I'll ask Anne if she'd like that or if we wanted to. Um... I just, since we know that Mackenzie's got a hard stop um, at seven so she can 
do her job of being the editor of the Yale Daily News, I, I don't really want to go past that and, and lose her. So I think right. we should respect that since we knew right. um, at the start that that was our limit. So. All right, well then, um, thank you very much for this discussion, for being so open and honest and sharing your experiences. Um, and again, I just, I can't thank you enough for being with us tonight and thank you for all for joining us, so. Thank you, it's been great. A lot of great questions in the chat and a lot of great comments. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I will say, I know there are still some questions. Um, feel free to email me. The easiest way to do that is if you go to my website, which is anngardnerperkins.com or easier to spell, yaleneedswomen.com. I've got a contact and thing that goes right to my email and I'm happy to send on to Mackenzie or Zoe or Connie any questions you have for them. Um, if you're interested in these stories about strong women, um, I have a quarterly free online newsletter that tells profiles one sort of strong woman from history each month. I'd encourage you to sign up for it. And if you don't know this history, um, read it. I mean, these women are so inspiring. You can listen to it in an audiobook, you can read it on an ebook. Um, but really, it has enriched my life to learn about these first women undergraduates at Yale, and I know it would enrich yours. Um, Mackenzie, Zoe, any um, any closing things you want to say? Yeah, thank you, Anne, for having me. This is a really great discussion. And yeah, I highly recommend the books. There's a lot of good information in there. And it's really um, interesting to see just how much Yale has changed and how much it hasn't. So yeah, I would just say, um, likewise, thank you so much for inviting us and having us. Um, and it also looks like based on some of the comments in the chat that there are some first women in the audience. So um, for myself as a current woman at Yale, and I would assume on behalf of a lot of women at Yale, thank you for pioneering um, co-education here to make it possible for us to enjoy the fruits of the university without some of the struggles that you guys had to endure. Um, and if you have any topics you think the YDN should be covering, editor at yaledailynews.com, send it my way. Um, but thank you all for coming and thanks for hosting. My, my understanding is that Virginia Tyson, who had won the book, is a first woman, and she has the book, and she'd like to pass it along to somebody else. Yep. And actually, if you'd like to hear from Virginia directly, she and I are doing a talk later this month um, for the Tewksbury, Massachusetts Public Library. So if you look on the website at events, you'd be able to meet Virginia through that. So. Thank you so much, Margaret Ann. And thank, thank you, you so much, Mackenzie and Zoe and Connie and all of you first women who made Yale a lot easier place for me as well. Thank you. Thank you for my to my friends and family who are on the this call and to all the first women. Yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.